What's up, friends? Today's episode of the Steve Weatherford Show is brought to you by Just Meats. I didn't say carbs, just meats. And you're wondering to yourself, well, what is Just Meats? Well, it's a meal delivery that comes straight to your front door, all natural, grass-fed, grass-finished. My family loves it. And it's become a part of our weekly dinner that one of the kids gets to choose. Are we doing beef? Are we doing chicken? Are we doing pork? Uh, and so we just love it because it makes things easy. It feeds my family. It feeds me. And I want it to feed you. So if you use code Steve15, go to justmeats.com and you'll save a lot of money. Enjoy the show. Arise, champion. This is the way. Famous Steve Weatherford Show, where each week we bring you stories, messages, and guests to create massive breakthroughs in your life. Somebody say greatness! This show has been strategically designed to accelerate you. Call a friend and tell them Steve Weatherford is home. What's up, friends? Welcome back to another episode of the Steve Weatherford Show, but this is not going to be just another episode, man. I believe that God's going to bring freedom to men who have been in bondage. I believe this in women as well, um, but I believe that there has been a lot of shame and a lot of guilt that men have been carrying around. And even through some of my podcasts that I've talked through, like, I feel like God is telling me that man, like men love to hear you talk about the freedom and the boldness that you're walking in right now, but they can't imagine what it's like to get over porn. Cause every time that they try that they stop. Yeah. And so I've got one of my really good friends here. His name is Joshua Broom. He has an incredible testimony. He's going to share parts of his testimony. He's also going to share parts of his new book that he's coming out with. Um, and I believe that I'm going to ask him to, to pray a special prayer, and I'll pray at the end as well, a prayer of freedom, a prayer of deliverance. Um, not just if you're listening to this podcast, you may have like given your life to, to Jesus when you were younger, kind of like I did. And then honestly, the world happened. And and you got caught up in your flesh and you got caught up in some of your goals. And then some of your securities came from some of the sensations of the flesh. And before you know it, like, man, I am really far away from the way that God is calling me to live. And I feel like the last five years I've been able to step into freedom, but it's been so helpful. It has been the X factor to be able to have men alongside of me who have walked through that freedom. Yeah. Right. And they can say, okay, here, step one repent, right? Give your life to Jesus. Ask for forgiveness. Ask God to come into your heart, but not just for forgiveness, but for full authority, yeah. right? And then to get filled up with the Holy Spirit. Those are the basics, right? right? Now, now that we've checked those boxes, now how do we actually recondition our mind yeah. and recondition what our expectations are and our vision is for relationships? So with all of those things being said, I want you to meet my new friend, Joshua. We've connected one other time, but now we finally sat down. I feel like it's a God appointment. So Welcome yes, to the jet stream, man. <laughs> Let's go. I, I'm going to give you the <laughs> microphone and I believe that you are, you have a message and I believe that I'm only going to interrupt you if I feel like I'm, <laughs> I'm going to improve, improve what you're going to share. Um, so I'm just so thankful to have you, man. Thank you for your boldness. Uh, and thank you for being a guy that doesn't just get his freedom and walk away from a, a world of darkness and keep his freedom to himself. Right. Cause it could be really easy and really comfortable for you to get your freedom. Right. Yeah. Or for some like me to get my freedom, but like, let me go live my life comfortable. Yeah. Like, let me not like continue to press it and be aggressive, not just for me, but for other men and for other families. So I honor you, man. I yeah. know that you and I haven't spent a lot of time, but I'm just so thankful that you're here. Yeah. I, I, I think it's, it's really important to kind of lean into like the, the, the divine appointment or God's coming. Cause we've tried to connect a bunch of times. We have. It just, uh, just hasn't worked out, but, um, Hey, for a time such as this, right? come on, come on. But I would just say um, to what you were sharing, because there's there's a generation of people who have found that first John forgiveness, but they haven't found the healing that comes from James five sixteen. Yeah, yeah. Because confession is not um, something that you should be ashamed about, because confession actually destroys shame. Mm, mm. So there's there's so many people who are walking wounded, and they believe that because of their shame, they have to stay stuck where they are. And I would just say, if you're listening to this and you are someone that struggles with pornography or struggles with habitual sin, uh, Romans 8, one says that if you are in Christ Jesus, mm -hmm. there is no condemnation for you. Shame and guilt is the language of the enemy, and it has no place in your life. Mm -hmm. 
So yeah. I would just say, man, uh, if you're if you're taking a step of obedience, saying, "Hey, I want freedom in this mm-hmm. area, or I want to change my life," we're proud of you. Mm-hmm. Because for me, a lot of my decisions that I made, a lot of the things that hurt me, a lot of the things that I did to hurt people, it was born out of a disbelief in myself because I never heard. Mm. I'm proud of you. Yeah. Father wound, right? Yeah, absolutely. Come on. Um, so I, I'll, I'll just share my story and, and feel free to interject. Yeah. But um, before you get going, I think it is so crazy because I was totally caught in the world of sin and like porn was like a regular part of my game. Yeah. And like, I definitely remember seeing videos that you're in and it is so crazy that you're a pastor <laughs> and I'm not a pastor, but I'm definitely bringing people <laughs> to the Lord and you and I are yeah. sitting here right I now. Know. <laughs> Look at look at God. <laughs> I just wanted to pause to, to, to make that yeah. to make that known. That You're a guy scene. that I, I just met for the first time, yeah. but I've seen your highlights. Yeah, <laughs> they were they were highlights to me now. Now they're lowlights, and we were yeah. making highlights together. Let's man. go. Bro. That's really cool, man. So tell tell yeah. your story. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, so for me, I grew up in a small town in South Carolina, and what was unique about my story was that my mom had me when she was 15. And I was born into a home that didn't have a father in it. Mm. But what was unique about my story, while uh, fatherlessness is something that unfortunately is normative in this culture, Mm -hmm. what was unique about my story is my father that I didn't have in my life was down the street. Wow. And the thing that I wanted most and the thing that I needed, I had a tangible example that I would see as I grew up. So it Uh went from something that I was confused about uh-huh. to something that was frustrating for me. Right, because it's right there, and maybe he's not choosing you. Right, 100%. Wow. And then not only that, you know, my mom and I, were, we were growing up. Um, she gets married for like a four-year period, drug addict, abusive, mm. terrible situations. And at the, all the while, he, you know, gets married, and he's got the, you know, the house, the white picket fence, the two and a half kids, and, and all the things that I don't have access to. Wow. So it's almost like I can see a picture of what my life could be but I don't have access to it. And then there's this multifaceted thing where, you know, you don't have something that you need and you believe that it's your fault Mm -hmm. that you don't have it. Mm -hmm. And then as men, um, most men have, then it's a worthiness thing. right? Oh, sure. And then also most men have this high achiever personality. So, uh, which is a good thing if it, if it leads you to operate in excellence for the glory of God. Right. But if it causes you to believe I can fix myself, Mm or if I earn enough, or yeah. if I do enough, I'll feel enough. Right. And that was the journey that I went on. So uh, I started modeling and acting when I was around 13 years old, um, got into theater. I was doing all the things, and I was, I was finding some success, and that led me to move to Hollywood. And I uh, you know, was modeling and acting out there. And I was doing okay. I wasn't crushing it, but I was doing okay. And Would um, you say that you were a struggling actor, or uh, were you doing better than most? Yeah, I, I was doing better than most, but... I was having more success. It was it was almost frustrating where it's like uh, you'll have success in an area where like you don't really want the success, mm-hmm. um, but that you're not as successful mm-hmm. in the thing that you want to do. Kind of like you want to go to the NBA, but they want you to be a punter. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Where it's like I mean I was I was very successful in modeling and like mediocrely successful at best at acting. Where it's right. like acting was the thing I wanted to do. Sure. Modeling was the low hanging fruit. And um, so while I'm there. Um, I'm in this restaurant, and these three girls walk up to me, and they ask me a question, and they ask me, um, well, do you, did you want to be an actor? Is acting something that you're interested in? And I thought they were talking about mainstream acting, but they were talking about porn. Wow. And it was and, probably three good-looking chicks that oh, were, yeah, they were three, fishing. Yeah. Oh, it was literally headhunters. There were, there were girls that were looking for wow. people to join the industry, and they were compensated if someone joined the industry, and then they were successful. They were compensated wow. based on their find. Wow. Um, but, yeah, so these girls said, hey, you know, we, we just want you to meet with our agent. Uh-huh. And it's, it's interesting while, you know, the enemy will use manipulative language that's familiar to you to get you to compromise to do the thing that you said you would never do. mm mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So for them, uh, mo- you know, you're talking about modeling, modeling, talking about acting, talking about meeting with our agent, mm-hmm. and I go and I meet with this agent, and I sit down with him, and, you know, why did I even go there? Mm-hmm. Like, why did I go to the the, um, the meeting? If you look back, when I was 13, um, that was the first time I was exposed to pornography, mm. and then, you know, 
if I if I didn't have a healthy example. And did you know that pornography was bad when you saw? Did you grow up in the church? Like what was that? Yeah, so I, I grew up uh, I grew up in the church until I was around seven or eight. Okay. Um, but my grandparents, devout Christian, uh, my mom, we didn't attend church regularly. Um, but also like, I, I never saw a healthy dynamic between mm. a husband and wife, really. Like my mm. grandparents were like, you know, they were older and my, my grandfather was like fishing every day and right. they, you know, they slept in different rooms. So I, I didn't have an example, like this is what a right. relationship, a marriage, anything would look like. But what educated me was pornography mm-hmm. and that's, you know. Romans twelve two talks about we're either being yeah. conformed by the world or being transformed by the renewing of your mind. So it's like the world was educating me because right. I didn't get an education, mm. and um, so that led to me living a very promiscuous lifestyle, especially like me seeking affirmation and then getting the affirmation from women and doing all the things that I knew were not good, but they felt good. Yet right. led to shame. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, I go to this meeting, and this agent asked me three questions. And did you feel like before you're about to go to the meeting that, like, things were, like, a little fishy or weird? Oh, sure. I mean, I, I knew what I was going into. I, I, was, I was like— Oh, so uh, you knew it was some adult stuff. Yeah. But so you it, didn't know how far it was. Right. So, okay. well, I was really, like, I was battling with, like, uh, like cognitive dissonance, where it's like I knew uh, what it was, yet my curiosity led me yeah. to, like, let me just go see. Okay. And uh, I get there, and, and I, I sit down with the guy, and he asked me three questions. Uh, How did you grow up? What are you doing in L.A.? And what do you hope to accomplish? And I said, um, you know, grew up pretty much just me and my mom, and I am out here trying to model an act, and I guess what I hope to accomplish is to become famous. Mm-hmm. And that was, that's so interesting in retrospect because famous is not a thing. Like, you can't, be, like, you, like, becoming famous, like, what's, What's the measurable according aspect? According to who or what? Right. right. Like it, and it's it's this this desire. It's like saying, I want to be rich. What's rich? Right. right. Because there's no cap. Yeah. Because if your heart is longing for something that you think is going to fix it, mm. there there's no supply that's going to right. do the job. Um, but I be, what I was really saying, I wanted to be seen. Mm. I wanted to be known. And I wanted to feel loved. Because mm. I felt rejected from my father. And, you know, I, I said yes to something I should not have. Mm. And I did, a, I did one film, and I thought, okay, um, this was kind of sketchy, kind of weird. It didn't pay that much. Um, I, I'm never going to do this again. So they didn't get the hooks in you the first time? Well, I, I didn't think so. Right. So I did it, and I didn't think it was that big of a deal. And, you know, for you know, this is like 2006. So 2006, it somewhat goes viral. And people see it, mm-hmm. friends see it, you know, my fraternity mm-hmm. brothers see it. And then someone tells my mom about it. And then I have this shameful mm. conversation with my mom. And then all of a sudden I get a one call. video and everybody saw it. Yeah. Wow. And then I get a, I get a phone call from my mainstream agent uh-huh. and she was, Hey, um, unfortunately we can't represent you anymore. So your name's tied to this. You're done. Oh, wow. So all of a sudden I'm in this crossroads where this one decision had imploded my life. Wow. And it's so easy to believe when you're in a crossroad like that, it's so much easier to continue to compromise. Sure. That, that you know, if, if you want to uh, become fit when you're not, the difficult thing is, you know, long obedience in the same direction. It's, yeah. it's difficult, like obedience and discipline. Those things are, are hard. Yeah. Changing some kind of aspects of your life are hard. So what would I what would I've had to do? I would have had to choose to do something else, develop mm-hmm. another skill, get some, you know, training in some other area because I couldn't do what I sought out to do. Yeah. But what wasn't true is I have to do more porn. Yeah. That was that was just a blatant lie, but the dangerous thing about a lie Cuz you've already, like you've already gone there so like you might as well. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's the dangerous thing about a lie. If you mm-hmm. believe a lie to be true, mm-hmm. it's true to you. Right. And then through that lie you see everything else. Yeah. So I believed, okay, well, this is, this is you know, the, the bet I've made. I've got a lie in it. So, again, uh, not being something I wanted to do, but this is just where I am. So if I'm going to do it, I'm going to be the best. Yeah. So I thought, okay, well, once I eclipse a million dollars and once I eclipse this and once I win these awards, that would validate myself in a way that would make my feelings of inadequacy go away. Mm-hmm. And then I'd make the money. I win the awards, and uh, it, it was so unique. So, that, I mean, I was, like, really tracking, like, okay, once I make a million dollars, and I did it, and nothing changed. 
your story and my story are like so similar in regards to like feeling empty, not and and that's it. It's very familiar to a lot of men that they didn't get what it is that they needed from an identity standpoint, and there may have been a narrative or an agreement that they've made, you know, like you're stupid yeah. and you'll never amount to anything. Yeah. Um, so many people have heard things like that and that has been the agreement that has needed to be broken. And for me, I was abused by a man when I was 12 and, and I, the, the lie the enemy told me is that I'm dirty, that I'm broken. And if people know this about me, that they won't love me. Right. And that's what got me, hooked into the world of especially pornography because it's such a quiet and in our minds it's a harmless it's a harmless hobby right well at least i'm not cheating on my wife right. um so anyway i just want to cue you back up man you and i are so similar that yeah. way yeah and so yes 100 percent. and i and i think that's why we're sitting here yeah, yeah. um but so it's like i i make the money and then for me i was like okay the money didn't work but if i become the best yeah then then that the feeling right. would, would go away. And um, I was nominated for performer of the year four yeah. years in a row. And then the fourth year I won it and I, I found out I won. And when it didn't feel like I thought it would, mm. it went from my anxiety that existed. It was amplified. Yeah. The depression that already existed deepened. Mm. And then all of a sudden I made a plan to take my life mm. because I was like, well, I've already ruined my life. Mm. And I have on a, um, so, so interesting to look back on. I have on a piece of paper, I'll never be a father. Mm. Like, I could get a girl pregnant, but I'll never be a father. I've disqualified myself from that. Yeah. I will never have a wife. Mm. Like, I could get married, maybe, but mm. I'll never have a wife in the way that I saw my mom disrespected. I saw the way that she was treated. Yeah. I wanted to be a father because I never had one. I wanted to be a husband because I felt like that is what um, was in me. I wanted to express what I didn't experience. Right. And then lastly, I'll never impact people in a way that leads them into positive change. Come on. I, I just, I disqualified myself from any of those things. So I thought, this is who I am. This will always be on the internet. I can't get out of this. I can't change. I can't make enough money. I can't have enough success and I can't take it back. So I might as well end my life because there's no light at the end of the tunnel. Mm. And um, so in that industry, on the memo of the checks, the directors would write antagonistic things or the titles would be grotesque. So I would never like hand it to a teller. I would just, you know, Dropbox, mobile deposit, like whatever. But on this day, the day I planned to take my life, I was like, okay, I'm going to go into the bank and slide the check across the counter. And it was almost me being masochistic where this is who I am. Yeah, this yeah. is who I am. And she's going to wow. affirm who I am so that it justifies what I plan to do. Wow. And just to provide. So you were looking for somebody to agree with you. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And what was, what was wild is um, the, the beauty of accountability is, you know, we got a relationship. And if, if you saw me doing something that didn't, that didn't align with the character you know that I have, you've got the authority to speak into my life and say, Josh, like, you're, you're doing X. Yeah. Um, dude, what's going on? That, that's not you. Right. And if you love that, that's what love looks like, right? So you yeah. love me enough to tell me the truth when I'm stepping out of bounds. And then I, I'm faced with two decisions. Either, Steve, you're right, man. Thank right. you for saying that. I, I really need to figure out what's going on. It's like maybe I've been, I've been working too much. I need to take you know, some rest or whatever it might be. Mm. But I need to repent and reset. That's it. Or I could say, hey, man, don't tell me what to do mm -hmm. and push you away. Mm -hmm. And the, the season of life I was in, I had pushed everyone away it wasn't in agreement with what I was doing. Right. To the extent where in that industry, I went by pseudonym, and I hadn't even heard my name in a year. Because mm. I had pushed any and everyone that said, hey, what are you doing? Mm. Like, I love you, and you're worth more than what you're doing. Like, you could right. be doing something else. Mm. I would hear that, and I would be like, nope. Mm. And even my mom. My mom continued to text and call consistently, and I ignored her because... Honestly, my pride mm. and my shame. Mm -hmm. So I was like, she's better off without me. Yeah. And I walk on the bank and slide the check across the counter. And I'm shaking. And I'm just waiting. Just waiting on her to say what I expected her to say. And instead, she looked at me and said, Joshua, are you okay? Mm. Joshua, how can I help you? 
Wow. And in, in retrospect, the, the beauty of that is my name means Yahweh is salvation. <clears throat> so me hearing my name, it woke me up, <clears throat> and I felt conviction. And the thing I felt conviction for was, man, I'm withholding the thing that my mom wants most, and it's not me to stop doing porn or to move back to South Carolina. It's to let her know that I'm okay. <clears throat> And I'm afraid that I'm going to get chewed out. I'm afraid that she's going to reject me. But I call her anyway. And she said, I love you. Mm. I'm proud of you. Please come home. So I did. Wow. So that was the day that I quit. But even though I was I was no longer doing the thing that caused me harm and I removed myself from the environment that caused me harm, mm -hmm. what I still had was the wound right. that the harm caused. Yeah. And I believed that I could man up. Mm -hmm. That I could, you know, mm -hmm. I covered up my tattoos, I shaved my head, I deleted my social media, mm -hmm. and I started working in the health and fitness industry. And I, I opened a gym and started doing all this stuff, and I thought I could put enough good dirt on my bad dirt so I didn't yeah. feel dirty. Yeah, you yeah. Know, I thought I... Uh, one of the things that I did when I was covering up my dirt to compliment onto what you're doing, because, like, the fitness industry, right, I went and I did psychotherapy, hypnotherapy, acupuncture to get rid of the depression. Cause I feel like what you're saying is yeah. like, I did these things to put on top of the depression, the anxiety, the unworthiness, yeah. the suicidal thoughts is, is the fitness. But then I also went and worked with all these different specialists. I never went to like the ayahuasca route. And I think it was probably more to do with the timing. It just wasn't popular at the time. I went more of the Adderall, yeah. uh, Adderall to keep up smoking weed to go to sleep and Percocets for the depression and the, and the loneliness. So I'll put you back on the tracks, but yeah. man, but the more that you're talking, the yeah. more I'm like, dang, man. Yeah. I mean, the same thing. It's like, I, 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 I tried to get enough, you know, accreditations and, yeah. and stuff as a trainer where I need Again, I needed to become the best. I needed to become the most successful. And, yeah. um, you know, I was, you know, I was on uh, every SARM and uh, everything like under the sun. And I was like, I've got to get like the most jacked and be the biggest and, mm -hmm. and the most successful. And I've got to do all this stuff so that yeah. it supersedes the way that I actually feel. Because I was walking around, I call it a first date mask, where mm -hmm. um, I didn't know who I was. But I lived my life pretending to be the <laughs> person that I thought you wanted me to be. Because mm -hmm. all I wanted for you from mm -hmm. you was your affirmation. Yeah. But I thought there was no way that I had any value to give. So I needed to pretend to be someone I'm not. Yeah. And what happens is we have a world of people walking around pretending to be they're okay when they're not. Mm. And that's definitely what I was. I was someone that was outside looking in. Man, uh, he had come out of that, and he's doing good for himself. He's doing good things. He's mm. helping people. Um, you, you really cleaned up your life. But inside, I still wanted to die. Whoa. And this goes on for about two years. And two years into it, um, this gorgeous girl walks in this gym, and I, I walk up to her and ask her on a date, and she, she says, no, I'm, I'm not interested. It's like, rejection. Yeah, I'm excited. I was like, so oh, yeah. I pursued it even harder, mm -hmm. and um, she she finally agreed to go on a run with me. And we went on a we we met to go on this run, and on this run, um, as I was waiting for her to get there, it's almost like I I heard my mom's voice in my head, and I think it was you know the Holy Spirit starting to to work on me, but um, it was don't you lie to that girl, mm. like don't you dare lie to that girl. Mm. So she gets there, and I was like, I got something to tell you. <laughs> right off the jump, yeah. let me get some off my yeah. chest. Dang. And, I, I mean, I, I feel like I gave, like, a, you know, a five-minute monologue. It's like, here's how bad I am. Wow. And what I was thinking was, I'm going to share that was with her because, number one, she's going to reject me anyway, and I'm going to end up hurt. Mm -hmm. And it's gonna, she's not going to want anything to do with me. Right. So I share with her, like, all the porn, all the stuff, and it's like, you know, everything that I could think of. And then she's pretty taken back by it. Yeah. I was going to say, you she's know, like, like that's gotta shy. be a lot. Yeah. And then she gets real serious and she says, are you still doing those things? I said, no, I'm just, you know, here. And she's like, well, you're not defined by the worst thing you've ever done. Uh -huh. And you're not defined by the greatest thing you'll ever do. Mm. There's a creator God that, has the final say. Whoa. Do you know who God is? And I was like, I think so. You know, I, I, I think that, you know, there's, 
uh, I, I believed in like the the cosmological argument where there's um, an intelligent creator right. that has an you know this design where there's you know there's there's all this stuff that's in place and there's consistency and all this stuff so it it, it makes sense you were like a universe guy yeah whereas like it, there's 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 got to be something out, existing yeah. outside of me beyond me that's created all the things yeah um including me so right. sure yes there's yeah. a god um she's like well i've been following jesus since i was in 7th grade and my entire family are followers of jesus and I'm not perfect by any means, but my relationship with him is the foundation in which I live my life from. Mm. So what kind of food do you like? I was like, what? Wow. And she's like, what kind of goals do you have? And I was like, well, you know, I want to squat like 515. And, you know, <laughs> I like, want to do a four-minute plank. Yeah, yeah. I want to, I want to, I want to, you know, in the same day, I want to squat 405 and run oh, a four-minute wow. mile, you know. Um, but she was and like. And so she was a killer. Yeah. And then uh, we, Damn. so that happened. We walked and talked for like two hours. And then um, after texting for a week on Saturday, she invited me to church. And this is like 2000 and. Uh, 2015. This is so recent, man. This yeah, is less so, than 10 yeah, years. Yeah, nine years ago. Wow. Um, she invites me to, she invites me to church. And um, so I, I go and mainly because wherever she is, I want to be. You yeah. know, so she just made you feel like accepted. Yeah. And, like, and also like she she cultivated this curiosity in me because mm. I mean, like Colossians four talks about like how like, you know, you, you want to walk with wisdom towards outsiders. And mm-hmm. in verse six talks about how you you know, your, your speech being seasoned with salt and gracious and seasoned with salt. So you might know how you ought to answer each person. And it, was, it wasn't what she said. It was how she responded. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's this great book called uh, The Master Plan of Evangelism. And um, Robert Coleman wrote it. And he talks about how. Um, people are not always looking for an explanation. They're more often looking for a demonstration. Mm. And she demonstrated both grace and truth to mm. me. And it just left me with curiosity. Mm. Like, how can you respond to what I said? Because she really challenged my my whole worldview. I thought I was defined by um, I'm fatherless and unwanted and I've done bad things. So I'm a bad person that has no value. Mm. And you're telling me that neither of those things are indicative of who I am as a man. Mm. And we... So you got grace, this major grace, right? Like compassion. I'm hearing you say like compassion and grace. So like how she heard me, the compassion with which she like heard you and the grace with which she moved forward was like, I hear you. Yeah. But this go this way. Yeah. (laughs) That's really powerful. Yeah. So that's the... So how long... So that... so that happened six days later. She invites me to church. Wow. And then, so I walk into church and I, you know, I'm, I'm looking around and there's this giant wooden plaque that says, we want to love people where they are mm. and encourage them to grow in their relationship with Jesus Christ. And mm. I was like, Jesus sounds cool, but if you knew my story, there's no time, there's no right. way. So you're still disqualifying oh, yourself, sure. but you definitely want to be around these graceful people. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, for sure. And then mm. I, I walk into church and uh, the pastor gets up and he starts, he starts sharing and he's telling the story from Second Samuel chapter nine, and he's mm. talking about this dynamic between um, Jonathan and David, and um, how when Jonathan and Saul were killed in battle, it, this now ended up with David becoming king, mm. and David um, being king, it, it was uh, it wasn't necessarily like dynastical, where like there was a son that Jonathan had that was supposed to mm-hmm. become king, but. Saul disqualified himself because of his sin. And um, anyway, so, so we're, he's telling the story, and David's different. Mm-hmm. So he, he asked, well, is there anyone left out of the house of Saul mm-hmm. so that I can show kindness to Jonathan? And um, I said, yeah, um, Mephibosheth is, is you know, a son of Jonathan. His name is Mephibosheth, but he's, he's hiding somewhere. He's, he's, a, he's been expecting death because historically – if there was someone that challenged the dynasty, then they were killed. Mm-hmm. If there if it was anyone that had access to the kingdom that would threaten the kingdom, those people were killed from the previous kingdom. Mm-hmm. And so he was in hiding because he was expecting death. And um, But David sends his guard, and instead of extending a spear, he extends his hand, and mm-hmm. he restores his land, and he brings him into his kingdom and gives him a seat at his table. And Mephibosheth, in the same way, I was resistant to 
um, receiving grace, mm. and it confused me. Um, in in Second Samuel um, nine eight, he talks about like, who am I? I'm I'm a dead dog. Like mm. what, what what who am I to receive what you're offering me? And uh, it's just a beautiful narrative of the, of the gospel because then the the pastor says, you know what? Um, Romans three twenty three says that we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So who's guilty? Mm. Everybody. And then Romans six twenty three says the wage of sin is death. So who's deserving of death? As Mephibosheth was thinking he deserved death because of his history, so do we. Wow. And then he shares the good news that Jesus lived a perfect life, born of a virgin, lived a perfect life, never mm. sinned, faced temptation, but he never sinned, died on the cross, rose on the third day. And whoever believes in him, his righteousness is bestowed upon you. Mm. You're made right with God because of what Jesus has done. If you put your faith in him, mm. you're forgiven, sealed. And um, I'm hearing this, and I'm wrestling with, I know this, I know this to be true, but is this true for me? Mm-hmm. Because sometimes when you don't see yourself as worthy of love, even when you're trying to be loved, you can't accept it. Right. Because you see yourself as so... Yeah, you have unforgiveness for yourself, so you can never really receive forgiveness. And if you can't forgive yourself, you can't love yourself. You can't love yourself. How could you love your neighbor as yourself? Right. You don't love yourself. Yeah. Um, and then right on time, he, he says, uh, I, I just wanted, I feel prompted to read this mm. out of uh, Hebrews twelve two, And it talks about it was with joy set before him mm. that he endured the cross. And I understood that Jesus was perfect. If he was God, he was perfect. And, of course, he was obedient to his father. But for someone to have joy, mm. there has to be love. Yeah. So what I didn't understand is there was a God that loved me. Yeah. Unconditional, right? And that wrecked me. Yeah. <laughs> that wrecked me. Um, so that that was the thing that I needed to hear. And, and it's so so I'm hearing you say it was like it was a logical it was a logical acceptance at that point. You're like, yeah. wait a second, like so what I'm hearing him say is regardless of my past he chooses me and he loves me yeah so logically you're like wow i can i can pour into this yeah so in in that moment i follow my face wow like, holy spirit arrest me the eyes of my heart's opened uh-huh. snot tears wow so then it, it so it was logical then it, then it was a feeling yeah wow and it just wiped me out and then when i stood up the pain and the guilt and the shame was gone gone and uh, that, that girl that walked in that gym that I pursued, that went on that walk with me, that confronted me, um, her name is Hope, and she's been my wife for eight wow. years. And we've got four boys. And um, I'll never forget the day that our first son was born. Um, he, he's born, and he's all, like, all slimy and whatnot. And, you know, the nurse is, like, wiping him off. And, I, and she's like, you can touch him. And I was like... All right, yeah, <laughs> and I'm I'm reaching in his direction, and he grabs my finger. And man, that was the first time I heard God speak. Mm. He said, "I love you more than that." Wow. While you would die for him, yeah, in the same way, I died for you. Wow. So we, you know, because of that moment, we named him Canon. So Canon in Hebrew means measuring stick. So he, yeah. for us, he's the measure of God's grace. Wow. Um, but God's did some miraculous things th- since then. So I got discipled in that church and uh, ended up going to Liberty and studying Christian ministries and then biblical theology. And, um, you know, but God kept me hidden. It, it was such a gift that God hid me for several years before I ever had a platform. Yeah, so, so what was story. the... What was sorry to interrupt? What okay. was what was the the healing of the wounds? Because you talked about that earlier. So I'm yeah. hearing you say, man, the first time I went to church, <laughs> I fell to my knees, man, and man, yeah. I was different. Things were lifted off of me. Um, depression, yeah, anxiety, suicide. Were those with you at all after that? No, completely gone. Yeah. Okay. So what about father wounds? What about like residue? What what kind of work? needed to be done and the reason that i asked that because i know that there are a lot of people that are like okay man that that sounds awesome but like i've said no to things before and i've actually felt like god's lifted things off but then yeah. i fell back into yeah it. yeah 
um, for me, I would say I, I did continue to struggle with, um, you know, w- the idea around sex. Yeah. Um, it was like a perverted mind. Yeah. Because um, that wasn't fully delivered. Sure. It was different, yeah. but it wasn't fully delivered. Uh-huh. Um, and also a lot of resentment yeah. towards my father. Yeah. And that resentment, a.k.a. unforgiveness, mm-hmm. um, it, it held me hostage. And I was walking with a limp. And I didn't even know it. Yeah. Right. And uh, so for me, so like spending time in the dark and just having conversations with um, just allowing people to have access into my life. Yeah. Um, the person that discipled me, we would have hot conversations every Friday. So honest, open, transparent. And he, he was more concerned with my thought life than my actual life where yeah. it wasn't the things that I was doing. Cause okay, it's great that you're resisting to do the thing that you ought not do. But what does the mental struggle look like? Yeah. Um, so that was super helpful for me. And um, God, you know, progressively delivered me for some things and, um, you know, did some counseling, did some stuff and just like processing deep wounds yeah. because, um, you know, put myself in some pretty dark situations. And yeah. just the reality, like at, to date, there's 33 people that I was in the industry with that have committed suicide. And just like two days before we're sitting down here, like recording a podcast that I just saw on the internet, there was like a 36 year old gal that was, yeah. So her name's Cagney and she was great friend of mine. Um, she got in the industry. Suicide. Yeah. She got in the industry the same time I did. We had the same agent. I knew her very well. And unfortunately that's the same story that 33 people have that either suicide or overdose. And what's crazy, so since 1990, 600 people either murder, suicide, or overdose. It's not that big of an industry. 600 is like 30, 35%. Wow. Um, And it's tied to... And the people that don't die, like, they're wrecked. Yeah. You know, they're damaged. The fact that you're leading people out of that and i'm sure just like me because i and i'll add on to this the same as me like i had a radical god encounter yeah and like god showed me like you're not responsible for this like lay these burdens down and i stepped into that and i released them but i remember going home confessing to my wife telling her this is who i was this who i'm committed to being and just to kind of give more context to people that are listening to this as well because i want you to know like what is what do the steps look like afterwards i also I also struggled with uh, resentment. I also struggled with perversion. I also struggled with, from time to time, like having a a depressed day, right? And the steps that I took towards freedom were every seven days I got together with men in a men's prayer. And I'm telling you, this is like, I'm sure that there's other ways to get to freedom, but I'm just want to share with people how I did. I got together with men every Friday morning at a church that's called Awaken. And they taught me the difference between religion and relationship, right? Yeah. Relationship with God, relationship with the Holy Spirit and who Jesus really was. Yeah. And as I began to learn more of that, and we got into small groups of three to four, one man would stand in the middle. And for me, example, I would stand in the middle and they say, okay, Steve, what are you praying and believing for? And I would just say, oh, man, I'm praying and believing that God's going to continue to like renew my mind and take some of these images away because I would still have thoughts that would pop back into my mind of yeah. some of the things that I've done or, or, or these different images of things that I've seen on the internet, right? And I'm like, I don't want to think that way. God, would you renew my mind? Yeah. And it was also revealed through prayer and I believe through word of knowledge of one of my friends that I had unforgiveness for my father, yeah. right? So I needed to be walked through the deliverance of forgiving my father, yeah. right? I also needed to walk through deliverance of forgiving myself because yeah. even though the Holy Spirit had touched me and I felt his power and his presence, there were still bondages and agreements that even though I'm saved and I'm going to heaven, yeah. that I still had access that I had granted the enemy yeah. because I hadn't forgiven my father, right? And so even though I'm, I, I forgive I receive Jesus to forgive me until I forgive myself and I forgive my father. I can't freely let forgiveness, hope, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. Those things can't flow through you. Yeah. And, and it was revealed to me that they were blocked and I was the reason that they were blocked. Yeah. And so I want to put you back on the, it's gonna, on it, the track. What I'm about to say is going to be almost comical hearing what you just said <laughs> i'm telling you you and i probably struggled literally with the same exact thing so go ahead and just <laughs> so tell god's glory <laughs> yeah man so uh I, you know going through the counseling doing all the stuff and then 
um, start getting opportunities to share my story, and, and God starts opening up doors. And um, about three and a half years ago, I'm in Dallas, and I'm speaking at this event. I'm staying at the Omni, and I wake up in the middle of the night, and I feel like this overwhelming conviction to pray. Mm-hmm. And I'm being lazy, and I'm laying in bed praying. Mm-hmm. And God was like, do you fear me? Mm-hmm. Do you revere me? So I get on my face. Yeah. And um, Holy Spirit met me in a way that has not happened before. Wow. And I'm praying. And what I'm reminded of is that you have confessed some sin, but you have blamed most of your sin on your father. I willingly went to the cross for you. Mm. So while the wounds of your father did impact the way that you saw yourself, it was upon your own volition, your own choosing Mm. that you did these things. So you need to repent Mm. of your sins and relinquish the the unforgiveness towards your father because what was true was often in my life when I was feeling depressed or anxiety or going through something and and having uh, really this like struggling with, a temper, because mm. um, if if I would feel if I would experience um, feelings of or like if I was struggling with an impure mind, yeah, I would get really frustrated. And yeah. I was like, God, what, like, why won't you take this from me? And I'm um, just very angry. And what was true was I was also saying, if my dad would have been there. I wouldn't have done those things. Mm -hmm. If my dad would have been there, my life would have been different. If my dad would have done this, this wouldn't have happened. And what is true, that did impact my mind. It did impact my emotions, but it did not force my hand. Yeah. So I had to, to manning up look like me on my knees, me on my face saying, Mm -hmm. God, I sinned against you. Mm -hmm. I repent or sinning against you, I did these things. Yeah. And also, like, God gave me empathy I didn't have for him. He was 16 years old when he, you know, got my mom pregnant. He, um, feelings of, like, imagine the shame that he felt as he saw you every day. And it's almost like he gave me a picture into what empathy could look like. Mm -hmm. And also he showed me the times that I should be dead, Mm -hmm. but I am not. So the father that I didn't have, that I needed to protect me, that need, I needed to say that he was proud of me, mm. uh, the father in heaven was saying, I was protecting you, and I am proud of you. Mm. But I need you to relinquish that because I have something greater for you. Wow. So. That was just in your bedroom. Yeah. Wow. So, uh, so that happened, and then mm. like two weeks later, I connected with someone where they were like, um, it, it was a deliverance ministry and it's like, okay. is, there, is there, is there a wound that you haven't processed? Uh. And the wound that I hadn't processed is I, I put myself in this place where, um, cause I was, I was doing, you know, I was doing porn, I was doing all the stuff. Um, and then people would say, you know, you know, I'll throw you a few thousand dollars if you'll bartend in this, um, you know, this event shirtless or whatever. And long story short, I had, I had done one of those events and, and it was in Paris and I ended up getting drugged and raped. And I believed that wow. it was my fault. Wow. And I had never told anyone that. And it was, and he, he, he was like, he was praying for me and it's like, where, where's all these things stemming from? And I was like, well, I couldn't protect my mom. Mm-hmm. And it brought me back to a place where I've been having this dream since I was seven years old of me pushing, uh, I've got a shield, and I'm pushing against fire, and I I'm, I'm, I'm feel like I'm getting burned. And then as, as my life progresses, it's like there's, now there's a lion with me, mm. and I'm, I'm pushing against fire, and now I'm safe. But now this, there's this mountain that's cracking in half, and there's water, and there's people. And those people need to be saved. Mm. And... He, re- he brought me back to this place and, uh, you know, we're, we're praying in the spirit and uh, what comes to the front of my mind is me pushing on a door when mm. I was a kid while my mom was being beaten and I couldn't open the door and I didn't protect my mom. Mm. And in the same way, I was reminded of, like, yeah. even in that, I was with you. Wow. 
and that's not your fault. Mm. So confessing those things and processing those things, like there was deliverance that needed to happen, and then when it did, <laughs> like wow, there was there was so much freedom that was available to me. And then I was, you know, I like Second Corinthians five seventeen is something I've had on. I got on like all kinds of stuff, but if you keep reading, it's like okay, yes, you know, you, you, you the dead is gone and the new is here. You're a new creation, yes, mm-hmm. but you're saved from something for something. You're now a messenger. You're a carrier of this word of reconciliation. Mm-hmm. You've got work to do, mm-hmm. and um, it just he allowed me to see myself in a way that. I never thought possible. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, everything that I was going to take my life for, Ephesians 3.20 is real. Yeah. He's done exceedingly abundantly more than I could ever hope or imagine. Mm -hmm. You know? Um, So that, that's, that was the, like, the the launching pad for everything that I've done now. And um, just asking, like, okay, how can I help people see the darkness that I was in in a way mm. that allows them not to have the satisfaction that they feel. Like how, like, how do I present this to you? Like, hey, this actually doesn't taste good, even if you feel like it does. Mm. Um, so I think that's the uniqueness that God has allowed me to have. But, mm-hmm. you know, just, just sharing with men, it's like, man, um, you're actually desiring something greater than that because the reason that you're consuming the pornography is that you've believed a lie yeah. that that's going to bring you into the intimacy that your heart is actually designing desiring but that the intimacy that you actually want is with God mm. but you are afraid or you've disqualified or you've done something that makes you believe that I don't have access to that so I need to to find it somewhere else, or maybe I've experienced rejection, uh, but the porn will never reject me, or or whatever it might be, and it's just man to, to see the fruit of freedom. It has to come from getting to the root of the problem, and the root of the problem is not going to be found until I come to the Father, fully, mm. and confess and repent and 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 get with people. So having people. Like having enough relational equity in my life, having like people know me well enough where I trust them, not with the ninety nine percent truth. Yeah. If you can share that one percent, that seem that seems unmentionable to you. Yeah. But it's actually holding you captive. Yeah. And it's actually minimizing your capacity. It's minimizing your boldness. It's minimizing your authority. Mm. Because even if you're forgiven, that vertical forgiveness, mm. that horizontal healing comes when I let people into my life and I relinquish the struggle of that 1% where I didn't want to mention it, I didn't want to talk about it, or I can handle it, I can deal with it. Mm. And when you let go of that, there's freedom on the other side of it. And, you know, there's there's much practicality of, you know, needing to take inventory of your life. And the, mm. everyone knows the playbook where it's like porn is detrimental to society. And we can talk about all the statistics and we can talk about how we need to take inventory of our life. If we want to change the way we eat, mm. we have to change what's in our fridge. We have to mm. take inventory of what we consume, mm. uh, which is true with media and, and all these things. But man, until you have a radical experience with a real God and you bear your soul to him yeah. in totality, yeah. you're going to stay stuck where you are because the, the language that the enemy uses is guilt and shame. Yeah. But confession is the love language of God because that leads to freedom. Yeah. I've done so many podcasts, Josh, that that I've shared like the practical. Because here's the deal, like phil- philosophically, everybody knows they've seen the statistics. Yeah. And so a lot of the ways that I like I teach and lead is like based upon my experience, right? Yeah. Like I don't want to teach based upon a book that I read. And so a lot of the advice and the wisdom that I've given around overcoming your flesh, specifically lust and pornography is very practical. But what I'm hearing you say, and this is coming from a guy who I would say, <laughs> the addiction was deeper because you literally were the one producing it. And I'm assuming producing it and also consuming it, watching Certainly, it. Certainly, yeah. Right. So a guy that was much deeper in the game than me, and I'll tell you right now, it wasn't the practical one, two, threes that set me free. It was, a, and I'll agree with you, is a radical encounter 
with the Holy Spirit, yeah. right? I'm like, and I just had this revelation two days ago that my middle name is Thomas. And, and it was literally yesterday, I saw my friend, her name's Cherie Genevieve, and I saw her at the gym. And I said, hey, Cherie Genevieve, and I gave her a hug. And she goes, what's your middle name? And I said, Thomas, but I'm not a, I'm not a doubter anymore, <laughs> you know? And she laughed, and I thought to myself, I was a doubter. I'm 41 now. I was a doubter for 36 years, dude. Yeah. And you want to know why I was a doubter? It was because I had never felt God. Thomas, in, in the Bible, Thomas needed to see the holes in Jesus' hands, and then he was a believer, and he gave God everything. Yeah. And I was a God that I needed to feel God, and then I would yeah. give him everything. Yeah. Even though after I felt him, I still had struggle. Right. right? I still had to renew my mind and go yeah. to therapy and go to men's prayer and, and, and have a hot seat with, with guys, right? Yeah. Being honest, open, and transparent. Yeah. That was really good. I'm going to take that, man. I'm going to have... <laughs> hot conversations with yeah. men in my life and also mentors in my life as yeah. well. Cause I feel like that's just like weekly accountability, not just like, how's your business? Yeah. Not like, how's your marriage? Not, Hey, did you get your workouts in and did you pray over your family and pray yourself and read Proverbs? Yeah. No, like, how are you doing? How's yeah. your thought life? Yeah. Right. Um, so that's really, really powerful. But what I'm hearing you say is I was a little boy that grew up with a dad that wasn't perfect. Matter of fact, he just wasn't there. And because of that, I experienced rejection. Yeah. I experienced abandonment. I experienced uh, not being known or chosen. And I felt like an orphan, right? Yeah. My dad is right there, but he won't choose me. And then at 13 years old, you realize that what I can do outside of myself in modeling or sports gives me value. So if I can do more excellence in that, maybe if I'm not value, I can do valuable things. Yeah. And that brought you to LA to do become more valuable by doing more valuable things because inside people don't love you and don't choose you. And through that, the enemy used familiar language to grab you and say, Hey, modeling, Hey, come over here. It's a little bit different than what you're used to. And you're like, you know what? I'll try it. Right. And then once you tried it, the enemy let it f spread like wildfire. So, yeah. so many people saw it. There was shame and guilt and you felt like, well, I've already done it. I might as well go deeper into the game. And you ended up becoming successful at something that anyone was like, oh, I'll give him a whole lot more success to bring him deeper into the game. Yeah. Because you didn't realize it at a time. There's an anointing on your life. There's an anointing for evangelism. There's an anointing for uh, administration to be able to build things, to disciple people up. Yeah. I don't know you that well, but I see that on you. And then I'm hearing you say, I had a radical encounter, but it came through invitation. Yeah. It came through invitations through someone who was living the standard of Jesus Christ, who was rolling in Jesus's compassion, yeah. who was giving out grace like dope. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And because of how she was and how she made me feel, yeah. I received an invitation to church and I encountered God through a sermon. And that sermon qualified me because King David and this Abebeth Sheth, Sheth, Mephibosheth Sheth, yeah. was a guy that his inheritance was death. And for yeah. you, you thought my inheritance is death. Yeah. But this guy is talking about through Christ Jesus, my inheritance is I'm a co-creator with Christ. Yeah. Right. I'm forgiven. I'm chosen. Matter of fact, I get a seat next to Jesus by yeah. God yeah. through his, through his blood. Yeah. I'll say yes to that. And then the Holy Spirit hits you. But through your process, after you had your encounter with God, there was still work to be done. So yeah. I'm still hearing you say things were hard, but now I had an identity. Now I had a purpose. And now I knew that God was real and I knew that God was good. Yeah. So I'm going to give him everything that I have. Yeah. Am I hearing that clear? 100%. So in that, I'm hearing you say that there's, there needed to be forgiveness given, not from Jesus. He already did that. I needed to forgive someone in my life. And I'm saying this as you're, you're hearing me, I want you to begin to scan your mind and we're just going to ask that the Holy Spirit would convict you and bring to your mind, because we're going to pray here in a minute. Who's that person that you need to forgive? I needed to forgive my abuser. And now I'm to the point where not only have I forgive my abuser, man, like I pray for him. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like yeah. if you get to the point through, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. that's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. crazy for me to think about, but I really cannot, not, not, I cannot do, yeah. you know what I mean? I just want God to like bless him and, and, and encounter him the way yeah. he encountered me. Yeah. Cause here's the deal. I don't believe I don't deserve to walk in like the joy that I'm walking in right now. Yeah. Because, of, dude, I've done some nasty stuff, too. Sure. You know what I mean? I'm just so thankful it wasn't in front of a camera. <laughs> 
said, but I confess, dude, I was a yeah. dirty dog too, yeah. man. Um, and I say those things to say, um, I, I need everybody listening to this. Who's that person? And it might be three or four people. I needed to forgive my abuser. I needed to, uh, I needed to forgive. There was a kid in eighth grade. I won't say his last name, but his name was Joey. I needed to forgive my accuser. So there was an abuser. There was an accuser. And then there was my father. Right? So who's the, who's the accuser for you? Who's the one that's labeled you? and kept you stuck in that label, who's the one that's abused you? And it doesn't have to be sexually. It could be emotionally. And then also, do you need to forgive your father? And I'll tell you, the answer is probably yes. You want to know why? I had, a, I had a great dad, right? But my dad was like Clint Eastwood. You know, he grew up with a dad that was very, very quiet and didn't say, hey, like, I'm yeah. proud of you, man. Like, you're a good yeah. boy. I know that you got yeah. extreme ADHD and you you got ants in your pants, but I'm proud <laughs> of the boy that you are. You know what I mean? Yeah. I needed that, man. Yeah. You know, because I was so different from everybody else. So even though I had a dad in the house, Josh, yeah. the enemy convinced me, man. He convinced me that even that your daddy is your soccer coach. Mm. He's still not proud of you. He just does it because he's, he has to. Oh, wow. The enemy robbed my enjoyment of my father. Because I believe the enemy said you're different. He can't love you. Mm. He doesn't. He doesn't rub your back like the other dads rub their kids' back and tell them you're a good boy. And so, like, I needed to forgive my dad. And you know, my dad didn't have a dad like that, right? So now, every time I go home, like I see my dad, I'm like, man, I love you, dad. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> and I just yeah. put myself all over him because um, I don't need that from yeah. my dad. But it is pretty funny to see how uncomfortable he gets because <laughs> I'm a big man. <laughs> um, so I need you guys to think about who do you need to forgive? And then lastly, forgiving yourself. Um, and I believe that as we pray this prayer, I believe that God's going to break lust off of you. And a lot of people that think they're listening to this because they have like a porn problem. You don't have a porn problem. You got an identity problem. Yeah. Right. And your identity problem is you've been trying to defeat things with like earthly techniques. Like yeah. you've maybe you've downloaded an app before and you're like, man, I found a way to circumvent the app. Yeah. <laughs> you're very creative. Right. <laughs> and so am I. And if you want to do it, you're going to do it. Right. Yeah. So we don't want to teach you or pray for you. So you enter like an AA. Right. Like I don't. And, and it's not against AA. I think AA is great, but AA won't get you to heaven. And, and people that stand up and say, hey, my name is Bob. I've I've been a, an addict for 12 years and I've been sober for 10. You know, why would you ever introduce yourself with your past? Yeah. And like after we pray this prayer, I just want people to know if there is ever a, an image or shame that comes up for you of something that God's about to forgive you for right now, you can know 100% if you're reminded of something that you've been forgiven for, you know, I'll let you know right now that's the enemy because God will never re-remind you of something that you've been forgiven for. That's how good Jesus' blood is. <laughs> oh, man. I, so uh, my, my wife and I, we were in a small group, and someone asked my wife, um, how do you not compare yourself to the girls that were in the industry and how do you not have some kind of resentment for him yeah. because of what he did and because it's tangibly there? Yeah. And her answer was, well, two reasons. Uh, well, number one, the Bible is true. Yeah. So 2 Corinthians 5.17 says you know, that that person is dead and gone. And also, why would I look at him and put words on him that Satan uses? Yeah. I see him as God does, yeah. and I use language that God does. So why would I look at him and talk to him as if I were Satan? Yeah. Because that's what the enemy wants to do. He wants to kill, steal, and destroy yeah. the joy and the satisfaction that's available to you and the forgiveness that you have. Yeah. That's good, man. Well, I'm ready to pray this prayer. Do you want to pray a prayer of salvation and deliverance, or would you like me to? Um, let me know. Yeah, I, I, I want to share one more thing. You can share some. Dude, one, we can go for more. another 10 minutes. I want you to talk about your book also before we get into okay, that. But there's, <laughs> that's there's, important but too. So that I would just say, so there's this, uh, there's this portion of Scripture in John 21 where um, Peter did the thing that he said he would never do. Yeah. And um, Peter saw some incredible things. He walked with Jesus, but he fell mightily. Yeah. And then there's this picture in John 21 where Jesus is restoring Peter. And he asks, he asks him three times, like, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And then if you look in the Greek, he's actually, he's asking him, you know, because when we say love, you know, I could say I love my wife and I love steak. You know, yeah. it's the same but different. But in the Greek, 
there are specific words that mean specific things, mm. and there's four different words for love. And Jesus was saying, do you agape me, which is the totality yeah. of love. And Peter said, no, I, I phileo you. And then Jesus said, do you agape me? He said, no, I phileo you. And then Jesus says, well, do you phileo me? He said, yeah. And what's true is, is Jesus is willing to meet you where you're at if you're willing to be honest. Yeah. And if you're willing to be honest, that's where freedom is found. Yeah. And the way that we see him in Acts 3 saying, you know, you crucified him. You denied him. You crucified him. You did the thing that I did. And I'm preaching with such zeal and passion because I don't want you to experience what I did because I knew what it cost me. Mm. So what's true is, is you can only be as free as you're willing to be honest. Mm. And if you're willing to bring, if you're willing to bring the true self, mm. who you really are, who you're really struggling with, not the person you pretend to be or portray yourself to be on social media or you hope to be, right. if you bring yourself as you truly are to the person of Jesus, he will take you to a place that you never could have got to on your own. Yeah. It's good, man. Um, I want you to talk about your book, but before you do, let's talk about this. Let's promote this. Let's encourage people to buy it. And then I want to pray, but I want to start by, there's a stoic, his name is Epictetus. And he has a quote where he says, wise men listen to the advice mm. of other men. Average men learn from their own experiences and stupid men don't learn because they have all of the answers. And I feel like you, we are sitting on a couch and there's two men who experience like the high extremes of what the flesh has to offer. Yeah. Like I gave my, my whole life to my goals and, and because of the lies of the enemy in John 10, 10, it says the enemy comes to steal, to kill and destroy in that order. And I begin, I believe that he first starts to steal our certainty by making us doubt. Yeah. Right. And at an early age, I began to doubt whether or not God was real and that he was good. And what he does is when he steals our certainty, he kills our identity. Yeah. Because as soon as I doubt that God is real and God is good, then I don't, then in my mind, I'm not a child of God anymore. Yeah. And he destroys my legacy, right? My ability to multiply in the earth. And that's what I believe that the, the enemy tried to do to you. Um, so talk to me about your book, about the seven lies that will ruin your life by Joshua Broom. Yeah, I mean... It, it's it's simply, uh, hey, this is what the world, a lot of what we're talking about, this is what the world promises regarding satisfaction. If you believe a lie to be true, it's true to you, and you live through that lie. And if you see through a broken lens, you're going to live a broken life. Mm. And not only are you going to experience pain, but you're going to hurt others. Um, so, you know, the, the two lies that really go hand in hand that are so important is this imitation intimacy. And, and it's really what we're talking about. Intimacy, if, if you poll 10,000 people, 90 plus percent of say, if people say, hey, what do you, what's the first word that comes to mind when you say intimacy? Most people are going to say sex. Yeah. But from a biblical worldview, intimacy is proximity to God. Mm -hmm. How close are you to God? Because if you find intimacy with him, the overflow to the rest of your life is going to be true intimacy. Yeah. But if your intimacy is found in pornography or sex or, or whatever it is, it's going to be less than. You have very shallow connections yeah. and intimacy with people. And then, the, like you were saying, like the, the enemy never, like, te like his lies are never blatant. They're yeah. always counterfeits. They look like yeah. something that will bring you right. satisfaction. And that's what the book's about. Um, it's, it's lies from the enemy and then truth from God and how I believe those lies and how they were detrimental to my life. But there's a truth that supersedes, dismantles, and destroys lies and a mm. foundation of truth that you can stand on mm. and how you can apply them to your life. Mm. Dude, I love you, man. I'm so glad that you came in here. We finally connected. <laughs> Absolutely, man. Um, I'm going to walk us through a prayer. And, and after I walk us through a prayer, if there's anything that you want to add on top of the prayer, um, but thanks for taking time to come in here. Thanks oh, for reaching out when you did. It's a total God timing. Yeah. I know that your book is coming out like real soon. March 5th. March 5th. So, um, yeah, we're going to, we'll probably release this, release this for you on the day 
we release on Wednesday. So oh, that's what's as, up, man. as close to the day as we can, we'll release yeah. it. We'll promote it. Um, and man, I'm just praying and believing for your ministry. Um, and before we move into this prayer, um, you know what? I'm just going to start praying. I want to, I want to pray for your wife, man. Please, Dude, if it wasn't for her, you don't get activated. Yeah. Think about that. Yeah. Like none of your ministry, none of these podcasts, these books, your salvation, none of that happens unless there is, there is a woman and that comes from a family, yeah. right? A family that just says, we're all going to follow Jesus. We're all, even though we don't understand all of the, the mysteries of God, we're going to choose to, to live in faith and we're going to love as Jesus loves. So God, we just thank you for hope. God, we just thank you for the witness that she is. God, we thank you for the bright light that she is. Thank you, God, that she didn't dim herself down. Yeah. God, that she made herself available to listen in com- in the compassion of Christ. God, thank you that she gave grace that is sufficient. And God, thank you that she extended an invitation into the house of God and that God encountered his son in a supernatural way that set him on fire. Yeah. And through his process of transformation, God, that he found freedom, that he freedom that he can't contain, freedom that he has to speak about and share testimony about. And God, we thank you that he is now anointed, that he's appointed, and that he has an assignment on his life and God we just pray for that family and that ministry it's in Jesus name we pray love you man all right now we're going to pray a prayer so everybody that's listening to this or watching this right now we're going to pray a prayer of repentance we're going to pray a prayer that you wouldn't just receive Jesus this time for his forgiveness but that you would receive Jesus for his full authorities that he would use you to trample on the enemy for signs and miracles and wonders that the Holy Spirit would fill you and then we're going to speak to the enemy and the bondage that may be over you yeah once you've been forgiven, you your your Jesus is your Lord and your Savior, and you have the power of the Holy Spirit. We're going to speak to forgiveness, and and we're we're going to speak words that will break chains. And if at any point you want to jump in and, and God speak it to you, go ahead and do that. So I want you to just repeat these words after me. And Josh, why don't you just repeat the words yeah. after me? God, I need more of you and less of me. God, I need more of you and less of me. God, I repent. God, I repent. I've missed the mark. I have missed the mark. I need your forgiveness. I need your forgiveness. I need you to make me white as snow. I need you to make me white as snow. I release my burdens. I release my burdens. My past. My past. My mistakes. My mistakes. My divorces. My divorces. My bankruptcies. My bankruptcies. My addictions. My addictions. My infidelity. My infidelity. My depression. My depression. I give it all to you. I give it all to you. And I ask that King Jesus would come into my heart. I ask that King Jesus would come into my heart. Not to just forgive me. Not to just forgive me. But I need that. I need that. But for his full authority. For his full authority. That he would heal every part of my heart. That he would heal every part of my heart. That he would renew my mind. That he would renew my mind. That I would think more like God. That I would think more like God. And I would have com- the compassion of Christ. That I would have the compassion of Christ. And from my overflow. And from my overflow. Would come grace and invitation. And would come grace and invitation. And I ask Holy Spirit. I ask Holy Spirit that you would fill me with your fire. Fill me with your fire. That I would step into your authority. That I would step into your authority. That I wouldn't be led by my flesh anymore. That I wouldn't be led by my flesh anymore. But I'd be led by your spirit. That I'd be led by your spirit. I speak to the spirit of unforgiveness. I speak to the spirit of unforgiveness. I bind you and I rebuke you. I bind you and I rebuke you. And I send you into the abyss. I send you into the abyss. I forgive my father. I forgive my father. I forgive myself. I forgive myself. And I receive full forgiveness. And I receive full forgiveness. That God would use me to forgive other people. That God would use me to forgive other people. That I would be a prince of peace. That I would be a prince of peace. That he would use me to carry hope. That he would use me to carry hope. And I bind and rebuke depression, anxiety, and lust. And I rebuke the spirit of anxiety lust and depression and depression i send him into the abyss of hell and i choose peace i send him to the abyss of hell and i choose peace god i believe that you're doing all these things i believe that you're doing all these things so i praise your name in advance so i praise your name in advance and it's in jesus name i pray and in jesus name i pray amen amen 
Hey, I think that might be the first time that we did any type of deliverance prayer on here. <laughs> you know, and it was it was a God appointment that we did it when you came here with the message that you have. Because here's the deal. Nine out of ten men, and this is Christians included, yeah. are struggling with porn. And it's not really with porn. We're struggling with our mother flipping identity, man. And so, man, I just, I'm going to keep praying for you. We're going to spend some yeah. more time together, man. Yeah, man. Can, can, can we actually go back in? Yeah, yeah, come on. Let's go back into prayer. Um, I, I, I just feel a, like God come on. prompted me. Um, Father, we thank you for your love. Yeah, come on, Josh. That we are good because you have made us good through your son. Yeah. That, God, we are enough in your name. That, God, we just trust in what you're doing in our lives. And, God, I pray for the person that is on the, the precipice, that you're on the cliff, that you're, you're almost Come ready on. to give up, that you feel like you're, you're too far gone, and whatever you've done, it's become your identity. I want to speak to right now the spirit of suicide, that if you're in this place that you're struggling with, uh, I'll never be good enough. I'll never Come overcome on, this. This is who I'll always Come be. On, Josh. God speaks another word. We pray against the spirit of death in this room and across these, this nation. And, and I, God, I just pray right now that you fill them with a supernatural love that doesn't make sense. Yeah. God, I pray on their skin, they feel your presence right now. Come on. That they feel in your heart that, God, you love them, that you chose them, and, God, you sent your son to die for them. Why? Why would you do that? Because you love them that much. Mm. God, whatever it is that's on this person's heart. Come on. That you break it right now in Jesus' name. Whatever it is that has happened to them, the thing that happened to them, it was not their fault and it doesn't define them. Yeah. And God, whatever it is that there, there's this spirit, I feel, this spirit of, of being lackadaisical, that, that, yeah, that this, there's this spirit of laziness, there's this spirit of I don't want to do it, it's too hard, it's too much work, it's going to take too long, I can't do it, I can't start over. There's someone right now that, that is in their 40s that is believing that you can't change their life Come on. and you can't become the thing that God is calling you to be because it's too late. I want you to know that right now is the time. Yeah. Right now is the, the time to do the thing that you've put off for too long, and it's time to do the thing that you saw to be impossible because that is the God that we serve. Come on. So whatever it is, the business, the promise, the pursuit, whatever it is, God, in your name, I pray that you give this person a supernatural confidence and a supernatural courage that comes from you. Download to them wisdom that doesn't make sense, supernatural wisdom Come to on. them. Break what everything Break whatever it is in that person that's causing them to believe the lie yeah. that they can't do it. They're not enough. It's too hard. God, I pray that you break that in Jesus' name. Come on. Come on. We're going to have to do an episode two, man. <laughs> uh, man, praise God. If this episode impacted you. Um, I would love for you to go pick up his book, but send this podcast episode to somebody who's been freaking getting beat up by the enemy yeah. for 24 years. If we're just talking about porn in general for 24 years, man, bondage, right? People would, I would achieve things and I would become things and, and people would tell me who I was and how great I was. But I always told myself, like, if they knew who I was or what I've done, they could never love me. Yeah. Just like you. I wanted to be seen, I wanted to be known, and I wanted to be loved. And and that's like my 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 hope and my prayer for this episode is that you feel seen, that you feel known, and that you feel loved by God, yeah. and that he wants you to give him your junk because he's got peace, joy, power, and authority yeah. for you through Christ Jesus. So share this episode. If you're watching this on YouTube, subscribe, hit the post notifications. And if you're listening to this on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, 
go leave us a review and go follow Josh. We'll put his link in the show notes on Instagram. And I would love for you to not only go follow him, but slide up in his DMs and say, you know what, this one or these two or these three things that you shared, this was really impactful for me. And the reason that I can say that without asking you is I know that you want to become better at telling this story and impacting more people. And I know that you want to disciple people. So slide up in his DM. He's got an incredible ministry that's just helping people to break through. I don't know all about it, but I know he's on the same team as me, helping men overcome their flesh, restore their families, and give God all of the glory. Anything else? I think you said it beautifully, my friend. (laughs) That's awesome, man. I'm going to promote you better than you could promote yourself in Jesus' name. I watched a lot of WWF as a kid. Oh, there we go. Give your life to Jesus. Brother. (laughs) (laughs) We'll see you guys next week. This week's episode is brought to you by Oxfit XS1. What's an XS1? It's without a doubt the most advanced and sophisticated exercise platform that I've ever seen. I actually have this exact unit in my home. The Oxfit XS1 blows my mind because of the capability and the durability. This is an at-home fitness platform that is industrial enough for me to max out my squat, my bench, and my deadlift with a real barbell in my hands. And it also has radical features like a rower, a ski erg, and live fitness classes on a massive three-foot touchscreen display. For more information, go to oxfit.com. And thanks for listening to the Steve Weatherford Show.